Okay, Dick, welcome to the summit. So I've just finished reading your, your most recent book, No Bad Parts. Just for anybody that isn't aware of, if they're just getting used to IFS or they're just sort of getting into it, I think it'd be cool now if we sort of maybe go through the model and the four kind of four kind of main parts of it, I suppose. So in my, in my view, you might be wrong, but that would be the uh, exiles, managers, firefighters, and then the self as well. So just to start off, could if we talk about the exiles, what would you say the, the purpose of exiles and how would you describe it to someone, describe them to someone who's never heard of them before? Well, um, most people have heard the phrase inner child and, uh, and so when I was discovering all of this, I would be working with people who would identify their parts and, and it was clear that some of their parts they had locked up inside in inner basements or jails and, and then others were managing their life and, and trying to protect them from those parts they'd locked up or protect those parts from ever being triggered. And I come from family therapy, so I'm a systems thinker. So I was, I'm trying to do what I did with external families, which is to look for patterns and how they related to each other. And that was the big distinction that leaped up immediately. The parts that had been locked away and then the parts that kind of guarded them or kept them locked up. And as I explored that more, uh, it seemed that the ones who had been locked up carried these intense burdens of, of uh, emotional pain or terror or shame or sense of abandonment or rejection or things like that. And as I got to know them better, um, what I learned was these parts weren't always like that, that before they picked up these burdens from traumas, they were these playful, lively, creative, fun-loving inner children who also are the most sensitive parts of us because they're young and innocent. And, and so they're the ones that get hurt the most by what happens to us these negative experiences and they take on these extreme beliefs and emotions that I call burdens. And so this happy, playful child got felt rejected by somebody and now feels worthless, now has the ability to take over and make you feel that and make you believe that you're worthless. And so it's hard to navigate life feeling like you're worthless. And so other parts sort of naturally try to lock it up and, and think they're only moving on from the memories and, and emotions of some trauma. And everybody around you tells you to do that. This is, at least in the United States, this is a, a kind of a survival of the fittest, just move on kind of culture. So everybody says, don't dwell on that, just move on, let it go, don't look back. So you wind up locking up the parts of you that get hurt the most or scared the most or feel the most shame, just so you can make it. And then, like I was saying about our, my country, <laughs> then you have a lot of exiles. And once you have a lot of these exiles, you feel a lot more delicate and the world seems a lot more dangerous because so many things could trigger them. And if they get triggered, they burst out of wherever you've got them and they can overwhelm you. And, and then it's hard to function and, so, and you have symptoms. And so other parts are forced out of their naturally valuable states into protective roles to try and keep the exiles contained and never trigger. And some of them try to manage your life so that nothing bad happens and people like you and uh, you don't get rejected or criticized. And, and uh, they might 
keep you a certain distance from people so no one gets close enough to trigger you or make you look perfect or perform at a high level. All of those things, or they might try to take care of everybody so that everybody depends on you or so there's a lot of common what we call manager roles. Mm. So these that's one class of protector, the the parts that are running your daily life. A lot of a lot of them become these inner critics because they think if they don't yell at you, you're not going to behave in the way they want. And uh, so we all have a bunch of those. Often they're called the ego. And they they got us this far. They deserve a lot of credit for that. But they did it by exiling a lot of our, our juice, really, the, these precious parts that got it's insult to injury. The injury was the trauma, but then the insult is we abandon them because now we don't like them. And so doesn't always work. Despite the manager's best efforts, we get triggered. Big explosion, flames of emotion are going to consume us. Something has to happen to get us away from that. So there's another set of parts who immediately jump into action to either get us higher than those flames of emotion or douse them with substance or distract us until they burn themselves out. So we call those firefighters. They're fighting the flames of emotion of the exiles. And most of us have a kind of hierarchy of those parts. And if the first one doesn't work, we go to the next one and so on and so on. Uh, and those parts, in contrast to the managers that are trying to keep you in control and please everybody, those parts will take you out of control. Will they don't care about the collateral damage to your body or your relationships. They just got to get you away mm -hmm. from those feelings right now, whatever it takes. And uh, so they're very impulsive a lot of the time. And they often uh, do things that people don't like. And so, so then your managers attack you for the firefighter activity. And, uh, and you get into that kind of vicious cycle. So that's the way most of us live our lives. Just back and forth between them. Um, so just to sort of maybe summarize, so is it fair to say that managers, although there's many different types of them, you know, you have your inner critics, you have parts, yeah, mostly inner critics, but um, there's ones that intellectualize, ones that mm -hmm. try and just sort of please others all the time and don't worry about themselves. Mm -hmm. All these different sort of types of managers but their their common goal is that they want to preempt the exiles being triggered that's right and then with the firefighters like these are the parts that come online whenever the exiles do get triggered and they're like we have got to distract ourselves from the, the pain here because this is too intense exactly right so the managers are preemptive like you said uh and then the firefighters are reactive they're they're after the fact, after the fire has exploded, they're the ones that go into action. These parts or these roles aren't the essence of um, what these what these parts are. These are roles that they were sort of forced into because of early traumas and hurt. Can you maybe yeah. tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, and again, this is a parallel to external families. So uh, family therapy's big insight was you can't take an acting out kid out of his family and tell him to just cut it out and expect that to work. Mm -hmm. You have to take a look at the larger system and see what's, what's going on in the family that's forcing that kid into that role, either to protect himself or to protect somebody else in the family. And when you, when you get that, you can make that diagnosis and then you change the structure of the family, the kid is liberated and no longer has to act out and can really be who he's designed to be. Turns out the same thing exactly is happening in the center system that uh, what I learned was you can't just go to a part and say, stop doing it. Stop, you know, making him drink all the time. You have to 
learn about how it's trying to protect other parts or is polarized with some other critic in there and start to work all of that. Uh, and again, I forgot your original question, but uh, in, in learning all that, what came to me at some point was, yeah, there are no bad parts. They're all valuable inner beings with these wonderful qualities to help us in our lives. And, and when they're, we don't suffer traumas or attachment injuries and so on, they're, they just help us all our life. They give us advice or they give us joy or they all kinds of things but they're forced out of their naturally valuable states by trauma and attachment injury. And they take on these extreme beliefs and emotions I call burdens, and they get frozen in the past. They get frozen in time. Uh, and they think you're still five years old and they have to protect you in the way they did back then. And so all of that was a huge revelation. I mean, I had no idea any of this was the case. Um, and it's that whole that whole thing that they aren't what they seem and that they can transform that quickly once they f trust that it's no longer necessary, just like the kid in the family. Uh, that's all, you know, quite wonderful. 100%. Um, it's just, it's such a... I just think it's such a powerful and effective model for understanding the mind, you know, and obviously these are just names we're giving things that are very complex to explain, but they do, they do a, an excellent job at, at that, I think. So I think now would be a good time to talk about the self as it's viewed from an IFS point of view. And yeah, what would you say, how would you describe the self to somebody who's never heard of, heard of it before from the IFS perspective? Yeah. So, you know, at, in the early days, as I was uh, working with parts and clients were describing them, and once I got hip to the fact that they weren't what they seemed, I was, I'm a family therapist, a systems guy. So I'm trying to have dialogues with the parts rather than battling with them, trying to get my client to listen to them rather than, than uh, get, try to get rid of them. And so I'm maybe have, I might be having you talk to your critic and ask questions about why it does it and listen to the answers. And as you're doing that, suddenly you're mad at the critic and the critic gets defensive and escalates. And as a family therapist, it reminded me of family sessions where I'm having two family members talk to each other, trying to have them listen to each other. Suddenly one gets angry at the other and you look around the room and you notice that a third person is either chiming in or, or subtly influencing the one who's angry. Mm. And you get that person to cut it out and maybe even move in the room out of the line of vision. And they settle down and they have a better dialogue. And maybe the same thing's happening in this inner system. As I'm trying to have these two parts talk, maybe a third one is interfering and making one angry. And so I began asking clients, to see if they could find the one who's interfering. And to my amazement, they would say, okay, yeah, I got it to move. It's, not, it's stepped out. And when, when they did, it was almost like this other person would pop up and uh, would be curious in a pure way and calm and would have confidence and even compassion often for the target part. And when I would do the same process with other clients, it was like the same person would pop out spontaneously, simply by getting other parts that had been polarized to open space. And when I would ask, if I were to ask you, okay, what part of you is that? It's likely you'd say some version of that's not a part like these others, that's me, that's myself. Hmm. So I came to call that the self with a capital S. And now 40 years later and thousands of clients later and thousands of people using this all over the world, we can safely say that that self is in everybody 
can't be damaged, knows how to heal, and is just beneath the surface of these parts such that when they open space, it pops out spontaneously. And that's a big deal. That's the big discovery of IPASS. And that changes everything. And so that's what I'm trying to bring is this awareness of that that is who we really are and that these parts aren't who we are. They are, in a sense, part of us, but even they aren't who they really are. They're, they're forced into these roles, they carry these burdens, all that can be changed. So it's a very transforming, transformative model. Something that jumped to mind there, you know, how does IFS think about loneliness then? You know, what's going on whenever someone experiences loneliness from an IFS point of view, would you say? Uh, well, they're, you know, like having just moved to Chicago, I don't have the friend network that I had back in Boston. And so uh, there are times when I feel lonely and uh, that's natural. And I, I know to go to the part of me that really suffers with that and, and be with it myself in the way we were just talking about mm. and help it because I was lonely as a kid a lot of the time and help it see that it, because I don't have a lot of friends here doesn't necessarily mean what it meant when I didn't have friends there and I can uh, that I can take care of it and I can also bring it into the present and be with it. So I'll still feel some of the loneliness, but I won't feel the intensity of the loneliness that I felt when I was young. And we can actually unload that piece of loneliness. So many of these emotions are natural, but then they become extreme because of our parts that are carrying the burdens from from past experiences when you really think about this it's a really empowering view of human nature to think that you have something inside that is capable of of healing healing you you know that's that's something internal to you and the metaphor that you use that, that i really like is that it's it's like the sun it's always there you know there's clouds there but if the clouds part it's it's always there you know um so it's a really, and it differs with other spiritual, I know this isn't a spiritual approach, this is, a, this is psychological, but um, it differs with other sort of meditation things and stuff. And, and the fact that the self actually takes an active role, you know, it's not something that is just passive and you, you experience from time to time. Can you maybe tell us about this, the active role it takes as well? Yeah, there are a lot of both uh, psychological and spiritual traditions that sort of have a, a sense of this place in us, but they see it as a passive witness rather than an active leader. And so I think that was partly my big contribution was to see that once you access that place, you don't want to just passively watch your parts and their, their, as they suffer. I mean, it helps to separate from them. And that's what's called mindfulness. You know, you can get into this mindful place and notice your thoughts and emotions without being them. But they're hurting. And if you just think of them as thoughts and emotions, you're not inclined to, to do much about it. But if you think of them as suffering beings, then you're going to want to go to them if you have real compassion and you're going to want to help them. And so people would spontaneously start doing that in my office. And I thought, wow, this, this self that we accessed knows how to do it and wants to do it and, uh, and becomes a kind of very active inner and outer leader uh, from those, you know, I mentioned four of the eight C words that we came to use to describe self. So again, calm, curiosity, confidence, and compassion. But people will also spontaneously manifest uh, creativity, courage, clarity, and connectedness. So those are what we call the eight C's of self-leadership. Very cool. And for someone listening to this that has maybe glimpsed this in themselves, um, 
what would you say is a good starting point to have more self self energy in their life? How would they go about that? You know, the main thing is uh, to just there. There are meditations. I think there there are meditations in the book to just focus inside, notice the parts of you that are you're quite what we call blended with that have extreme beliefs or thoughts and uh, feelings and sensations and just ask them to open a little space in there and the mere the mere act of them stepping out and separating a little bit relaxing you'll immediately feel more space in your body and you'll feel your heart open up and um we you know you it's a very palpable exercise. You can actually feel the embodiment of yourself. And as you get a felt sense of what it's like to, to live from this place of self, you become much more aware of when you're not there, much more aware of when these parts are blended with you. And then you can ask them to open space in the moment. So when I come to do an interview like this, I'll notice any parts that are nervous or, or I'll notice how much confidence I have or those eight C words. And then departures from that, I'll just ask those parts to relax and open space and I'll feel this big shift. And if some of them won't do that, I'll say, okay, I'll bookmark that and say, okay, this is something I got to work with because for whatever reason, it's not, it's not stepping out. Mm. And then after our interview, uh, any parts that need attention, I'll give it to them. But in the moment, I want to be in this open place with you. One of the groups of people that could benefit most from IFS would be entrepreneurs, um, leaders of organizations, because I, I guarantee like so, so many of people, so many people in that those sort of situations are being run by protectors and if you could free that free that up and operate from a place of self it's a whole different it's a whole different game you know and those are the people that are influenced in society i know you've got to go dick it's been an absolute pleasure to um speak with you today to read the book it's the book is an experience because you're getting the i think you're getting the most essential ifs theory but then as you move through that there's exercises and examples of, you know, how this actually applies in session with clients. So there's so much in there. And it's, I haven't read a book that's like laid out like this before. So it's a, it's a very, very valuable learning resource for anybody that's interested in using this either personally or I suppose professionally as well. So just want to say congratulations and um, best of luck going forward in your in what you're doing with IFS and getting this out into the, into the wider world, you're doing a, you're doing a great job. I know it's, you must wake up every day and think, what is, you know, what is going on? This is crazy. So just well done and keep going and, and best of luck. Well, thank you. It's, it's always great to talk to you. Uh, Cause you do your homework. I really felt honored by how much you studied this and the questions were great. And, and so anyway, I always enjoy talking to you now. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the show. If you'd like to hear the full version, you can do so with the Weekend University Premium Membership. This gets you access to our master library of over 230 talks and interviews with the world's leading psychologists, professors, and authors, as well as transcripts, CPD certification, quizzes, and unlimited access to the recordings from our annual conferences. For more information, please go to theweekenduniversity.com forward slash membership.